have uh, some folks still coming in. Uh, we, we always try to, to honor those who are on time. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Good evening. Welcome. Uh, as most of you know, I'm Craig Snyder, I'm the president of the Royal Affairs Council of Philadelphia. And I'm really truly uh, delighted to present uh, to you this evening uh, a quite extraordinary group of, of foreign affairs uh, experts with a wide range of both experiences uh, and points of view. Um, now, it, would, it really would take the whole time we have together if I were to go through their bios and tell you all the wonderful things they've done, so we're going to skip that. You can look them up. Um, uh, we have asked each of our panelists uh, to open with a few minutes uh, of opening remarks, um, and then we're going to have a, a sort of a globe-trotting uh, conversation about questions of U.S. national security uh, and about competing schools of thought as to how the United States should best address the challenges of the world. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance for a little bit of sort of awkward staging, so I'm going to stand here uh, for the conversation because we only have, uh, we have less microphone channels than we have people, um, and I'm going to need to use this one, and they will be a little bit passing back and forth. There, there are, there's one less channel than there are participants. So with that, um, let me just quickly introduce to you, uh, in the order in which uh, we will hear the opening remarks, uh, Michael Carpenter, uh, Senior Director at Penn's Global Biden Center, uh, Carol Raleigh Flynn, uh, President of the Foreign Policy Research Institute, Malcolm Nance, Counterterrorism analyst and contributor for MSNBC and NBC News, uh, Noah Rothman, uh, associate editor of Commentary Magazine and also contributor for MSNBC. So please welcome our guests. And with that, Michael, we'll have you take it away. Thanks. Great, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Uh, sure. Great. Uh, so I was asked to start off with sort of a general <coughs> overview of, I guess, the state of national security, for lack of a better term. And um, as I was thinking about this, what comes to mind is sort of the defining element of this time, uh, of this particular point in the 21st century, is the distinction between uh, national security politics during the Cold War era, which was an ideological conflict uh, sort of utopian systems, communist dictatorship on the one hand, liberal democracy on the other, and the current period, which is much more fluid, non-ideological in many ways, but not entirely, but it is very much, regardless of what part of the world you look at or where your expertise lies, it is very much our geopolitics are enveloped in a competition of real world governance systems. And sometimes this takes on an ideological flavor, sometimes that ideological flavor is masked. But the key defining characteristic, I think, of the current time and the challenges we face today is the competition between liberal democracy on the one hand and illiberal oligarchy on the other. And I characterize the other as illiberal oligarchy as opposed to authoritarianism because it is not always authoritarian. And I think sometimes our lexicon is a little bit lacking in terms of how we describe this conflict because oligarchy can also manifest itself in democratic systems and it is doing so with a vengeance, I would argue. Uh, and taken to its logical conclusion, it often leads to, or invariably leads to, a form of authoritarianism because oligarchy is the concentration of political and economic resources in the hands of few. Um, and that tends to diminish institutional checks and balances and therefore diminish liberal democracy, the systems, the institutions, the norms that we think of as being part of liberal democracy. Um, but not always, and so we, we have a situation in the US where I would argue oligarchy is very much present. We have uh, democracies trending towards authoritarianism like Poland and Hungary, which are very much in the throes of oligarchy that could very well become authoritarian. In Russia and Turkey, it is full-blown 
authoritarian oligarchy, but very much oligarchic. And the same is true of Xi Jinping's China and of many other authoritarian regimes around the world. Now, why is this important? Because there's a couple of dimensions to this. One is the geopolitical dimension, which is where authoritarian oligarchies are seeking to undermine Western liberal democracies. And they are doing so uh, by using dark money, uh, disinformation, corruption, uh, energy coercion, covert operations, any number of different tactics to try to undermine our liberal democratic systems here at home in our own countries. And then there's a geopolitical angle to this as well. If you think about, say, Vladimir Putin's propping up of uh, Bashar al-Assad in Syria or Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela, where clearly the goal is to back fellow authoritarians and strengthen them against the, from their perspective, corrosive influence of liberal democracy and specifically of the United States. So there's a geopolitical game going on. There's also an internal governance game going on. And sometimes I think we lose sight of this big picture because oftentimes it's little events that happen that are part of this war of, or competition of systems, right? It's corrupt influence here on the margins. It's paying off a politician uh, with dark money from Russia or Saudi Arabia or Iran. Um, little tiny pieces, but when you add it all up, it really is a very stark competition and one where our adversaries, the authoritarian oligarchies and oligarchs, illiberal oligarchs in fellow democracies, they view this as an existential war, a zero-sum game. They want to take us down, and we just haven't woken up to it yet. We have in certain instances, but not to this overall pattern. Um, so that's what I will say by way of introduction. I was asked to be brief, and, and those, are, those are my thoughts. Thank you. Really, please. Is this on? Uh, wow. <laughs> uh, I don't think I was given an idea of what I was to say initially. So um, what, I, what I thought I would talk about are what I perceive to be some of our key national security threats. And um, obviously at the top of the list, at least obvious to me, is weapons of mass destruction. Um, and as a corollary to that, um, technology and all the changes in technology. Um, one, of the, one of the key issues, I think, is the lowering of the barriers to entry to weapons and technology that can pose a threat to us. Um, several decades ago, the world was really bifurcated. It was Russia, the Soviet Union, now Russia, China, a handful of nuclear powers. Um, proliferation has occurred. Those weapons are falling into the hands of more people than at more countries and more potentially non-state actors than ever before. And so I think that poses a, a very dire threat to us. Um, technology is the great leveler. Um, you can purchase just about anything you want, cyber tools on the dark web that if not maybe carrying a punch of nuclear warheads are still very disabling to our critical infrastructure <coughs> such as our state systems that underpin transportation, financial systems within the United States, um, uh, let's say transportation, um, uh, power grids, uh, and the use of all these technologies together pose an even greater threat than before. Um, uh, threats to our supply chains, again, um, to our critical supply chains that underpin our economies, um, and of course cyber and um, cyber warfare and potential undermining of our system through cyber. So I think, uh, to my mind, those are the key threats, and it's not just state actors, it's the potential of this, these tools used in combination coming into the hands of non-state actors criminal elements and others. Let me put it this way. Uh, I think Michael did a great job of explaining how we are in an existential battle 
for between two types of superpower. And in the old days, as you said before, it was the Soviet Union and the West, right? Soviet Union bad, totalitarian societies, keeping people locked up, putting up an iron curtain behind, in some places, an actual physical wall. And then the United States being the beacon of democracy, uh, knocking down totalitarianism and fascism in World War II, and then establishing ourselves as the pinnacle of democracy and spreading democracy as a core principle of the United States throughout the world. And I, I find this fascinating because we are all, if you aren't actually from here, I'm going to say you're here, but we are all Philadelphians. I was born here in Philadelphia. I was born at the old Naval Hospital. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I come from a very, very old military family. My family started when my great-great-grandfather and great-great-granduncle ran away from slavery in 1864 uh, and joined what would become the 111th U.S. Color Troops. And there has been a Nance in the armed forces in every year since 1864 including my niece who was in combat off of Yemen last year. So what does that have to do with the threat? What, the reason I'm giving you that little history lesson and making you feel good about being in Philadelphia <laughs> is that everything developed, thought about, and enshrined in our founding documents in this nation, in this city, right down there at Fifth and Chestnut, it's not just an existential battle between a liberal democracy and these oligarchies. It is an existential battle whether the American project survives the next nine months. It is as plain and as simple, the greatest threat that we have to the United States, and I can't even believe that as an informer intelligence professional, that I would be saying that the greatest threat is not an external foreign power, but an insider threat that has manifested itself in such a way and coordinated with foreign powers in such a way that one third of this nation refuses to believe anything that comes from empirical evidence, the news media, things they can see before their very eyes to the point where they are literally assisting in the undermining of the very documents that they claim they love more than anything. You know, I often get criticized in the news media, uh, considering that I work for the news media, but every once in a while, I wake up and I check my Twitter feed and there's about a thousand tweets saying, you're an idiot. <laughs> and I immediately know, what did Tucker Carlson say about me last night? <laughs> I have been on the A block, first words out of his mouth on Tucker Carlson three times last year. And the most amazing one to me was when he played a video clip of me having a discussion with Brian Williams about the Russian scandal, the Trump-Russia scandal. And we were going over the ABC basics of it that everyone has agreed upon, that, that, that the Mueller report, you know, literally wrote in hundreds and hundreds of pages that we all see with our own lying eyes. And he was describing it as if I was describing the Martians had landed on Earth. <laughs> And he could not believe, he actually said this, can you believe what those liberals at MSNBC are talking about? And so I went on to Twitter right away and I said, hey, everything you said is true. Everything you said is true. You played a video clip of the truth. But he was reacting in his audience in such a way as if we were all crazy and 40% of the American public were all wired in. We are going through the greatest upheaval in American history right now. And I, I argue that this is a greater danger to the American project than the Civil War. Because at least the Civil War, there was some ration and logic and reason going on behind their argument that they had a right to maintain people in slavery and make free money off of their labor. They actually argued that and separated through votes, through some legal processes. 
Granted, it took almost a million dead people to resolve that issue, but it appears that what's happening now is a far greater threat. We have people who believe in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States who are now saying it is okay for a foreign power to come into this nation and jury rig an election, and they're fine with it because their person won. Just today, we find out that the President of the United States may have actually tried to bribe Julian Assange, the head of WikiLeaks, who his own CIA director called a non-state intelligence actor, which means the CIA and other agencies have verified that WikiLeaks was a laundromat for Russian intelligence knowing that they were getting that information from a foreign source. There's an indictment out right now to get Julian Assange to the United States. But today, the president, we find out that the president of the United States, two years ago, may have sent a representative to him. And the deal was, is that he would insist that it had nothing to do with the trump russia scandal. We have a president of the United States who is fighting to cover for a foreign disinformation attack on the United States so that his ally, Vladimir Putin, would not be held accountable for it. You know, I often am asked, how is it that you possibly could have figured all this out? You know, I was the first person in US media on July 26, 2016, one day before Donald Trump confessed to the world. It took me four days to convince MSNBC that there was an attack going on against the United States using disinformation and WikiLeaks was the weapon system that was launching these vectors of trash in order to get Donald Trump elected as president. And after I made that statement, right up, right up almost until the election, I was called crazy, often. But everyone was so busy watching Hillary Clinton's email leaks, which were not even her emails, by the way, they were other people's emails to the point where they couldn't fathom that American democracy itself was under attack, not just by a foreign agency, but by people in this country who decided that that foreign agency's efforts benefited them so they would rather destroy the system that we have because it worked for them. And we're at the point where now the United States, okay, is one of those liberal democracies, small l, that is now being taken apart bit by bit by bit through norms that are being destroyed, laws that are being run over. The threat to this nation is going to affect every one of you personally, psychologically, and quite possibly economically and physically at some point in the next year, depending on what happens this November. And let's say that Donald Trump is stopped this November. Well, the period between the election and Inauguration Day, and I think it was Clint Watts who may have said this, may be one of the most dangerous periods in the history of the United States. You know, the President of the United States is a nuclear monarch. He has the authority to launch an atomic bomb so long as it's at a legitimate target without any controls whatsoever. I'm not saying he's going to do that, but knowing what you know right now that has happened in this country, could you doubt that he might not be thinking that at some point? Of course you know. It's a, you know, they're, they're calling it as a joke on MSNBC, Mika Brzezinski's Law, or Mika's, Mika's Law, where all you have to do is say, would Donald Trump do that? And Mika's law is, yes, <laughs> he would. This is a far greater threat than Iranian nuclear prol proliferation, North Korean biological weapons, you know, Saudi Arabian, you know, paid Israeli hackers. Okay, the entire fabric of the American flag is being shredded, and it's being shredded with happiness by some people in our own country. 
What's that phrase, that, that, that old saying they used in Star Wars? How does democracy end? To thunderous applause. And I, I, I'm afraid that that's where we are. So those of you who don't know what Commentary Magazine is, it's kind of a home, I guess, a center for ideological neoconservative thought, which our critics deride as bloodthirsty, bloodthirsty adventurism. And so I'd be remiss if I didn't fly that impact flat very high. Um, in December of last year, um, people with my inclination got a pretty serious wake-up call from the Washington Post, published an expose on the two decades in which across several administrations, agencies responsible for overseeing the conflicts in Afghanistan knew that it wasn't going well and were telling you the truth. Uh, and it's not as though everybody couldn't see that with their own eyes, but this was a revelation to know the extent to which the American public were not being told what everybody else knew inside the, inside the government, that the conflict in Afghanistan wasn't, wasn't going to work, we weren't going to win. And that was, it exposed a serious conceit for interventionists, the conceit that they had privileged and cherished for so long, which is that American conflicts abroad, particularly nation building, work when the political will exists. And the political will didn't exist in Vietnam. And the political will didn't exist in Iraq. But it sure existed in Afghanistan for two decades. It existed and it failed anyway. Now this is an existential crisis that we're all very familiar with in the interventionist community. We are made to confront our failures on a fairly regular basis. The alternative, non-intervention, the non-event, is much more difficult to account for. But the evidence that that failure is as profound and prolific as any other interventionist failure is evident in the case of Syria. In 2011, when another Arab Spring revolt became a civil war, it was more than apparent at the time that this was going to become a conflict, and some of the most fought, of, fought over soil in the world in Levant would require American diplomatic and perhaps military intervention, but we declined. In the intervening years, there was a humanitarian crisis and a migrant crisis that spread into Europe, which upended the political consensus that had been built over generations and is now in retreat. The norm prohibiting the use of chemical weapons has eroded to such a degree that rogue states, including Russia and North Korea, have used them in terrorist acts on foreign soil. A transnational terrorist group of the kind that history has rarely seen erupted, and when we did intervene, when we were compelled to, we, and we had no other choice, we did so at a time and choosing, at a time and place not of our choosing, in suboptimal sub and disadvantageous circumstances. This is a failure of non-interventionist politics. One, I'm happy to point out, but few are of the minds uh, who are inclined to, to be suspicious of intervention are inclined to confront. I don't think that's going to be something that they can evade much longer, particularly when we're considering now that the great powers that have filled this vacuum that we left are coming increasingly into conflict. Russia and Turkey did so in 2015 and are increasingly likely to do so again as we see now. The Syrian government under regular attack by Turkish forces and vice versa. Um, this is something that I think uh, interventionists like myself and commentary magazine are are happy to point out and we're happy to engage with. Uh, and it's, it's rare that we get a forum to do so like this. So we sincerely appreciate it. OK, thank you all. All right, so um, uh, let me make something obvious. Uh, we have, let's see, uh, we have just over an, an hour, including time for your questions. So we're going to knit all that together really perfectly. Um, and you're going to leave with, with answers to, to everything that's been raised. Um, actually not. But the, the point, of course, is to raise questions, to plant seeds, and to have you go away thinking about so many of the important issues that have, that have been raised here. Um, so I, I want to start this, this discussion off by kind of posing a construct uh, that leads to a question and then have you, and then have you respond. Um, so the, the construct is that what we now understand looking back from the, from the Trump period uh, is that uh, for at least the last 50 years, maybe the last 70 years before the election of President Trump, that it, it now looks in hindsight like American foreign policy was actually played sort of on a regulation football field with identifiable kind of liberal and conservative, more interventionist, less interventionist teams, um, but that there were some really sort of, there was really a, a sort of underlying um, fairly high degree of consensus ab about the uh, fundamental as the phrase goes, indispensability of American power in the world, 
and the United States being the fundamental guarantor of, among other things, uh, free commerce, the movement of people, uh, and a and, and a and a uh, at least ideal of a movement towards democracy. It, it seems to me that we can agree that the election uh, of President Trump and the foreign policy that he's pursued have kind of scrambled that playing field and scrambled the teams. So in in some places and at some times in some ways, President Trump acts and speaks very much like a Reagan or, or George W. Bush interventionist. Uh, in other ways, at other times, uh, and with his invocation of, of the notion of, of America first, um, he, he hearkens to people who throughout American history have argued that the best place for the United States in the world is out of the world, right? It's really to be home, protected by the oceans, and letting uh, whatever happens over there uh, stay over there. So my first question to you is looking at what we've seen in the last three years and projecting ahead to the possibility of the continuation of, of a Trump administration, is there a Trump doctrine? Is there any kind of policy here uh, that one could use to predict what he'll do in this situation or that situation? Or is, it re or is this really this sort of accumulation of different impulses, uh, is it really incoherent? And I'm going to start the opposite way we were. We start with no, we'll go down. Yeah, so um, what Donald <coughs> Trump gives voice to rhetorically, but is not necessarily evident very much in policy, is <clears throat> sort of a Canaanite worldview, which is much more popular. So we can describe is a classically liberal approach to trade and international relations and, and even interventionism. Um, when Pat Buchanan's 1992 campaign uh, failed, that's, that sort of strain of ideological thought on the right uh, declined. It is evident on both the right and the left. Um, it is ascendant now on the right. But when Donald Trump took office, there was no intellectual infrastructure to implement that kind of thing in the Republican Party. To, have, to staff an administration, you essentially had to go back to the Bush years, the Reagan years, George H.W. Bush administration, and they executed a pretty conventional Republican foreign policy. Donald Trump had no interest in striking uh, Syrian uh, airfields, for example, in his first year in office. That sort of contradicts just about every philosophy that he articulated on the campaign trail, but it was nevertheless the policy that he was convinced to pursue. Um, we're going to get to this, I think, in a little bit, but the president's record on Russia is far more confrontational than just about anything he says. His sordid uh, displays of deference to Vladimir Putin are not evident in policy. If you are a Russia hawk, as I am, if you think that this is a, a dangerous regime that is risk prone, that knows it has a window and is working its, as, far, as hard as it can, as fast as it can, to secure its assets and its benefits before that window closes, you should be pretty happy with a lot of what the president has done on Russia. The execution, the first of all, the maintenance of Barack Obama sanctions from 2016, the imposition of Magnitsky, Magnitsky Act sanctions, which the last administration opposed, the seizure of diplomatic property in the United States, the expelling of diplomats, interceptor missiles and liquid natural gas to Poland, lethal arms to Ukraine, fighting set-piece battles with Russian mercenaries in Syria. All this stuff doesn't make a lot of sense from Donald Trump's worldview. It does if you accept the fact that he has surrounded himself with conventional Republicans. In term two, that's not going to last. The second term of an, of an administration, a lot of the talent moves on. You get a lot of people coming in who are not necessarily, who are more ideologically in line with the president, and the president has zero checks. This president is entirely unchecked. This president has now been acquitted in impeachment. He survived a special counsel probe. There are no more checks on Donald Trump in term two. So he will pursue the policy that I think will be his instincts, and his instincts are toward isolationism and retrenchment. I think we'll see a lot more of that. I think Noah's right about, uh, to a certain extent, about the Russia policy that we're seeing uh, play out, which appears to be strong. And the only reason that it appears to be strong is because the system of government that has been in place for nearly ever, uh, with regards to, this, to, to how we operate against the Soviet Union, then a new imperial rising Russia, uh, pretty much is on autopilot. Donald Trump had nothing to do with the special forces savaging 250 Russian mercenaries from PMC Wagner, which is a Russian mercenary group that came in to kill the 12 special forces that were there, the Syrians, uh, Syrian Kurds, and seize an oil field thinking nothing would happen. Well, 
I spent 20 years in the military, 15 more in the intelligence community. What's going to happen is, is that we are going to savage you in combat. I mean, don't, don't step up to us. It is just that simple. And somehow, excuse me, they got the impression that we wouldn't flex. And they got that impression because you have this, uh, you have this sort of schizophrenic worldview of what Donald Trump wants with his mentor, Vladimir Putin, which is clearly deferential, obsequiousness. I mean, it is literally slavish in its level of devotion. Uh, and he wants to get rid of sanctions. He wants to lessen the, you know, to uh, tilt the playing field in Russia's interest. The problem is he doesn't know how to do it. And he doesn't care that there are people in his administration that do know how to do it. Because if it doesn't come out of his head and his mouth, then it doesn't get done. In my last book, uh, a book called The Plot to Betray America, which was about how he and his staff compromised U.S. national security constantly in a near, in a near constant basis. And the way I describe what I would call the real Trump doctrine is buy me, but you buy America. If you influence me for my personal, financial, or family benefit, then I will do something for you. And all you have to do is look at the relationship with Saudi Arabia. Look at the relationship Jared Kushner has with Qatar. I mean, he, he, he was a billion dollars in debt, and then suddenly a Qatari subsidiary from Canada buys out all his debt in the middle of a, a all you can call it, it was a psychological war that was going on between Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. Uh, all you have to do is look at how he insults China one minute, but if it benefits his family, he draws back from that. Look, Donald Trump is the most criminal president to have ever sat in that chair. And I mean, history is going to find out whether he gets a, fourth or a second term or not, just precisely what was going on. We already see, I mean, second only to Nixon in the number of criminal convictions of his staff. His national security advisor didn't make it a month. And it turns out that he was worse that he was dealing with uh, Russia and promising them things, we now found out that he was also providing, going to provide nuclear, Russian nuclear reactors to Saudi Arabia, which the Trump administration went through and gave permissions to. I mean, we can sit here all night and checklist all the things that they have done which would topple any other presidency in American history. But with regards to a doctrine, there's no doctrine. What I'm seeing here, and look, I'm a trained intelligence professional. I'm a field intelligence person. That means I have to watch it from the ground. I have to determine a pattern here. I have to intervene where we can or report so that it can be short-circuited or allowed to run out because it's going to short-circuit itself. With Donald Trump, there's only one constant, Donald Trump's ego. And to the intelligence professionals around the world who are advising their world leaders, this is a boom. You can do anything you want right now. America is completely off guard. Democracy, literally democracy building efforts was taken out of the mission statement of the State Department. Literally, every word of it. So that being said, what you have going on here is not a government that has a heartbeat, right? It has a Twitter beat, that's pretty much it. But the rest of the government is fibrillating, right? It's just shaking out of control. And what is operating is operating in spite of Donald Trump. But I can tell you right now, there's no doctrine here. Uh, it's, uh, it's like that old line, I'm, I'm pulling into Hollywood platitudes today, that old line from Apocalypse Now where he says, um, he's operating up there without any rational reason. And Martin Sheen says, reason? I don't see any reason. Well, that's precisely where we are right now. We have a crazy Colonel Kurtz with a Twitter account. Okay. <laughs> so let me preface my remarks by saying that I work for a nonpartisan. <laughs> so if anything I say strikes you as partisan, it's not intentional. Um, doctrine, the Trump doctrine. Doctrine implies consistency, and I don't think we've seen consistency from the president. However, what we have seen, for the most part, and you might disagree with me, Malcolm, is transparency. 
I would say this is one of the most transparent presidents we've ever had. If you want to know what he thinks, ask him. It might change from day to day, but you have stream of consciousness daily from this president and his tweet account. It's all there. Uh, the other thing I would say about this president, to the extent he can, he has tried to keep his promises. Uh, he hasn't been able to keep a lot of them, but I made a, a quick list of Donald Trump's promises before he came to office or at the beginning of his uh, administration. He said he'd renegotiate NAFTA. He'd throw it out. Now, you might say it's the same NAFTA, but he did throw it out and he renegotiated it. He said he would get rid of the JCPOA, the, the Iranian agreement. He did. Uh, he said he would ask countries to pay more for defense, the NATO countries. He did. He said he would, uh, he would um, declare China a currency manipulator. He did, didn't he? He said uh, he would withdraw from the TPP. He did. He said he would, let's see if I can read my hand right uh, He would, uh, oh, move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. A lot of presidents have said that and didn't. He did. Um, I have a few other things here that I can't read. But, <laughs> but, but I, and I'm not defending him, I'm just saying the man to the extent he can, does what he says he's going to do. But it's inconsistent, and I don't think you can call it a doctrine if it's so inconsistent. Um, let me see if I have anything else here. Um, no, that's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I noticed you left out that whole protect and defend the Constitution. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> All right, I, I don't know what's left to be said. <laughs> well, let, me, let me try and pick up a couple streams here. Uh, so doctrine, no, but there are definitely instincts and impulses that guide Donald Trump, and we can pick them out, and we can identify those trends. So first of all, he wrote to power on an anti-elite platform, right? This goes to what Noah says. The American people were fed up with elites telling them that they knew better how foreign policy should be executed through two tremendous blunders, the forever wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And you know, Americans, I think of all persuasions, saw this and said, hey, wait a second, we were supposed to be greeted as liberators in Iraq. What happened to that? $2.5 trillion later, uh, thousands of American lives lost, not to mention tens if not hundreds of thousands of Iraqi lives lost. Afghanistan, ditto, um, similar situation. The housing crisis, uh, under Hank Paulson, the clueless Treasury Secretary. You know, elites saying they know they have a grasp on things and, and really not having a grasp on things. And Donald Trump very assiduously, very cleverly tapped into that sentiment and used it to, to gain power. And now that he's in power, his, not doctrine, but his MO is to say, screw the elites, they've gotten everything wrong. Listen just to me, I will get it right. And for the, whatever it is, 42% of the American people who support Donald Trump, that is the word. That is the word. He is right because he says so. So that's point number one. Point number two is there is um, an element of a paradigm here. The paradigm is whenever the U.S. enters into any kind of multilateral arrangements, we get screwed. Um, and so we have to essentially contend with the world alone. Hence, America first. Um, he hates the EU. His ambassador to the EU up until, uh, I don't know, a couple days ago, Gordon Sutherland, said in private his mission was to destroy the European Union. That is also uh, Steve Bannon's mission. That is also Donald Trump's mission. Um, it extends also to NATO, although Trump won't say it as explicitly, but he came pretty close during his campaign by calling it obsolete and doing Vladimir Putin's bid. Um, when it comes to the UN, same thing. Uh, hence the ideological affinity between Trump and John Bolton. They despise multilateral institutions and think the U.S. always gets, um, uh, always becomes the sucker when we sign up to any kind of collective action. Uh, next element of his foreign policy is deception. Uh, a lot of times Trump will, he's the master of the spectacle as the reality show uh, uh, star that he is, uh, take his summit with Kim Jong-un in Singapore. 
masterful choreography. Uh, you had any number of respected commentators, including former directors of the Central Intelligence Agency, almost crying on TV about what a wonderful opportunity this was to finally realize the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. I guarantee you there will not be any denuclearization of the North of the Korean Peninsula. Um, uh, and I think actually Donald Trump knew that from day one. I, I think he really did. I, I, I think he's not stupid. Um, uh, but there is this element of deception um, and spectacle to his foreign policy, and you can find more examples of it. And then finally, what Malcolm said, um, I wholeheartedly agree with, self-interest. Um, his decision to um, influence the Department of Justice not to take action against uh, Hulk Bank uh, in Turkey is a clear example of how the ties between his own princeling, Jared Kushner, and uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan's princeling, Minister al-Bayrak, uh, uh, form a confluence of interests that then influence his policy. And we see it time and again, uh, uh, and Malcolm made allusion to uh, several other examples of that. So doctrine, no, but there are enough data points here that we see a clear pattern, and we should be able to maybe not predict what his next move is, but understand how he will react under various different circumstances. Thank you. All right, so doctrine, no, instincts, impulses, patterns uh, of a sort, yes. Um, let's try to drill down on the other side, uh, on the Democratic side of the Democratic candidates. Um, so for somebody like me uh, who came of age in the Reagan era, it is, um, it's just stunning to watch the Republican Party uh, start to talk as if there is no real great threat uh, from Russia, uh, that there's no need to nurture U.S. post-war uh, alliance uh, system uh, or to project power uh, broadly throughout the world, um, while seeing the uh, Democratic Party start to speak in those very terms, or sort of Reagan-esque terms, um, certainly anti-Russian, uh, and, and even to a certain extent uh, more interventionist. Really kind of in a way, uh, a lot of what we're hearing from, uh, from Democrats, prominent Democrats today, sounds more like the kind of Democrat that we probably last saw in the White House in LBJ. Um, so my question is, um, is, this, is this real? Uh, if the country elects a Democratic president in November, are they going to have foreign policy that is uh, more sort of conventionally or, or pre-Trump conservative uh, than, than that of President Obama, such as on the Syria issue? Or uh, is this just election year? Is this just we Democrats are for whatever Donald Trump is against and we are against whatever Donald Trump is for? And I'm gonna, this time we'll start in the middle. We'll start with Raleigh. Um, I think it's very hard to generalize about the Democrats, so really all over the map. Uh, in terms of their national security and foreign policy orientation, I think we can say that they tend to be more uh, attuned to human rights issues. I think we'll see some changes on our policies toward, for instance, Saudi Arabia, uh, regardless of which Democrat comes in. Uh, I don't think we'll see the big, you know, overwhelming approval of arms sales to Saudi Arabia that we saw, for instance. Uh, China, we might be harder on the weaker, the Chinese treatment of the Uyghurs. Um, one rare point of um, consensus between the, uh, the Republicans and the Democrats, for the most part, is their concern about Huawei. Um, we've seen that in the last couple of weeks, and it's been Pelosi expressing concern as well as the administration. Um, on the area of climate change, I think that's one of the few areas where the Democrats all agree too. But then let's let's go to trade agreements. Bernie Sanders hates TPP. Biden, correct me if I'm wrong, Biden basically supports it. Maybe wants to tweak it a bit, but supports it. Um, others are are in different places on TPP and trade agreements. Um, so I think uh, at this point, the Democrats are the full spectrum, uh, except for a handful of areas where there, there's consensus among the Democratic candidates. 
I, I think it's a lot simpler. I, I think what you're seeing in the Democratic Party, even including Bernie Sanders, is it's not so much, I mean, granted, they all have their own individual beliefs about what they should and should not do. But the comment made earlier about the Republicans have sort of shifted to this sort of pro-Russia uh, party, which is really true. I mean, they have become whatever Donald Trump says they are. And now that is, of course, Vladimir Putin good, Russia fine, we should have good trade relations with them, you know, a country that we have less uh, trade with than Chile, uh, as I like to refer to them on television quite often, a uh, trailer park with atomic bombs. And no, really, this is, Russia is a superpower only in the sense of the size of the country, their use, their, their, their possession of atomic weapons. They are not an economic superpower other than the fact that they have oil and gas and weapon sales that they are now taking over markets that the United States used to dominate throughout the Middle East and Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa. But all that being said, I think what you're seeing in the Democratic Party is not a shift. What you're seeing is the maintenance of normal versus the imbalance of crazy. <laughs> no, quite honestly, and I use that as a professional intelligence term of art, right? <laughs> which means we are seeing something which is beyond the parameters that were predicted through precedence and observation. That's crazy. So the Republican Party has completely gone off kilter. Look, I started as a Republican when I was a young, you know, uh, baby collections operator. I voted for Ronald Reagan in my first election. And granted, they're a very partisan organization. They use power. Uh, by the time the Clinton impeachment came through, I started wondering, why am I with these guys? I don't like these guys. I was more of a Colin Powell's type, type Republican. Well, right now on the liberal spectrum, he's far left. And he didn't move a centimeter. What moved was the beliefs that whatever Donald Trump says is the policy, has shifted them to follow that base of 40, 42% that believe whatever he says is awesome. So therefore, the Democratic Party is maintaining the norms that have existed in power politics, real politics, since the Normandy landings, right? The maintenance of the United States with the Atlantic Alliance, from Washington to liberal European democracies, capitals in Europe, as opposed to this Vladimir Putin version of neo-Eurasianism, which is Russia will subvert all of those liberal democracies using disinformation and the most lethal weapon system to any democracy. How do you get rid of a democracy? You vote it out. You have an election that has been rigged or that has been influenced due to dis disaggregate amounts of propaganda, which is what we're seeing in France, Austria, Hungary, Italy, Spain. The United States is a victory in their column. They got their man, and he is doing just precisely what they wanted. Why would you even have to worry about sanctions when you have a president of the United States that thinks that will speak to you in private, will not share anything that he says with his entire administration, and constantly leaks out that what he wants is to please an ex-KGB officer with everything in his heart. I mean, you're talking, I mean, it sounds crazy, like a bad Tom Clancy novel, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, we are living in a really bad Tom Clancy novel. Worst part was he was a real conservative. But that world doesn't exist anymore. And it may be rebalanced next year if Donald Trump is put out of power and he allows the party to move on from him. But I doubt it. I think we are going to be in an existential battle between normal America as it's existed since, you know, uh, the ratification of the Constitution and whatever this tendency to move us to what I call a constitutional autocracy, where the Constitution is a big leaf and autocracy is really how we are running things. And the Bill of Rights applies to just some of you who are rigged in with those guys. So I think I want to answer this question through the prism of a single issue. And that is the advent of hydraulic fracking. 
fracture, fracture and fracture. Um, <clears throat> so in 2009, there was a, a whistleblower with an international agency said that essentially we had reached the point of diminishing returns to oil production, that we had reached peak oil and sent a bit of a chill down everybody's spine. But at the same time, we were developing this technology, which allowed us to extract hydrocarbons from rock uh, structures that had otherwise not been explored. Since then, the United States has become and will become a net energy exporter in 2022, and it's roughly energy independent. Um, and we lifted in 2015, late 2015, early 2016, a prohibition on the export of uh, fossil fuels abroad. And in international relations terms, this really did change just about everything. Um, so from a democratic perspective, this is not great. Uh, just about the exception of Joe Biden, everybody has expressed some hostility towards this. I don't know whether a president could simply, through executive order, insist that states cease this, this practice, but they could on federal lands. Um, and it would certainly not advance their agenda. The agenda that the Democratic Party has advocated is the isolation, international isolation, and imposition of pariah status on regimes like Russia and Saudi Arabia. You don't do that in the absence of fragment technology. Fragment technology has allowed us to pursue a hostile policy towards Iran that was not in the inventory of the Bush administration or the Obama administration. The Bush administration was confronted with an insurgency in 2006 where American soldiers were dying on the battlefield as a result of the shaped charges that were crossing the border for the made in Iran. They didn't impose sanctions on the Iranian oil sector for fear of the shock that it would have in the international market. That fear has evaporated. We are since we have since imposed those sanctions on the Iranian energy sector and to no effect on the American oil market. Um, over the course of the last year, we had a series of escalating Iranian productions attacking the international energy market. They were seizing ships in the Straits of Hormuz. They were pirating those ships. They executed one of the most brazen, sophisticated ground strike on the world's largest petroleum processing facility in Saudi Arabia to the sound of silence a decade ago. That would have necessitated an international military mission just to restore commerce. That didn't happen. Why? Because we now possess the capacity to halt shocks. Saudi Arabia said we're going to ramp up production. We released an unspecified amount from the strategic reserves, and you didn't feel it. That's the kind of thing that is miraculous. That gives us, by the way, in Israel. Congress mandated quite a long time ago that we move the embassy to Israel. Nobody can do it in the absence of this kind of an energy policy. With this energy policy, we recognize the land rights, we move the embassy into to Jerusalem, and the Arab Street revolt that everybody anticipated being materialized. Why? Because the Arab Street has a lot of bigger problems closer to home to worry about. And most of those are originating out of Tehran. Now, I don't know whether the Democrats are just playing politics and whether they would pursue this kind of policy or take these tools, these valuable tools, right out of the tool shed. I kind of don't think so. But I'm not sure, and that's kind of scary. Well, I, I should actually note at the outset, I should have said this earlier, uh, that I uh, advised the Biden campaign, but I'm not a member of the campaign staff. I don't speak for them. I'm speaking only for myself. Um, I, I find your conclusion there a little odd. The fracking revolution happened under the Obama-Biden administration. So why one would presume that anything would change under a Democrat is beyond me. But, um, but to the question about Russia, um, and, you know, I remember sitting as the senior most uh, Pentagon official at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in a hearing in July of 2016, chaired by Bob Corker, who was then the chairman uh, of that committee. And, you know, in his typical Tennessee twang, I remember him, you know, looking me in the eyes and pressing me on, you know, why wasn't the Pentagon doing more? And, okay, we were doing that, but what else could we be doing and what should we be doing uh, to contain Russia's aggression and to respond to it and counter it? Um, and I miss that, Bob Porker. <laughs> you know, I miss those Republicans. Um, what I will say, though, is that, you know, I talk to a lot of Republicans on Capitol Hill and maintain friendships across the aisle. And at least the elected representatives in Congress, I don't know if this is good or bad, depending on how you view it, but they all have the same views on Russia as they did before. They don't, they just don't say them as loudly now as they used to. Um, it's the party faithful, really, that have flipped in terms of those public opinion polls. 
um, which is scary. Uh, but that's a whole other subject. We could get into cult psychology and a bunch of other things, but I won't go there. On the democratic side, um, I think there's a real there's a real difference of views on how to contend with Russia. Um, and uh, just bear in mind that Bernie Sanders was one of only two United States senators against 98 who voted against the CATSA sanctions package to impose additional, more punitive sanctions on Russia. Um, and uh, which, you know, some attribute that to the Trump administration's tough policy on Russia. Well, it wasn't really the Trump administration, it was Congress that forced this through. But two people voted against it. Mike Lee, a very conservative Republican from Utah, and Bernie Sanders. So, and, you know, Bernie uh, in the 90s was against NATO enlargement. He thought it would be a provocation of Russia. It's fair. There are other people who held that view. Daniel Patrick Moynihan debated with Joe Biden on the floor of the Senate on this very issue. Would we be provoking Russia or would we be bringing freedom to the peoples of Warsaw, Prague, and Budapest and that they deserve to have that freedom regardless of whether it provoked or did not provoke the Kremlin. Uh, but there is a real, I bring this up because there is a real difference between say Joe Biden's views on Russia, which are we must counter them because they are attacking our democracy to uh, a Bernie Sanders. And then, you know, in between, I think, uh, you know, I can't really speak for the other candidates, uh, but they fall on, on a range, right? So, um, so that's where I think we stand. All right, so I want to move to uh, talking about some specific uh, areas of the world with, with challenge and, and, and for which the next president will have to give attention. Um, I want to do this as a kind of a lightning round, so if everybody can sort of limit their answers to less than a minute, then we go. Okay, the first one I want to start with is uh, something that, that Noah brought off, which is uh, Afghanistan, where Americans are still dying, right? Two, two last week. Um, I think it's a, I want to pose as a, as a uh, proposition that we really actually have a bipartisan consensus on withdrawing from Afghanistan at this point, regardless of who wins the election. But the question is, are we going to withdraw in a way that history will judge to be very much like the way we withdrew from South Vietnam, which is to say, under the cover of a peace agreement, but in reality, uh, withdrawing not only our forces, but also our commitment to training and logistics for the Afghan government forces. And then in all likelihood, in a year or so, the Taliban are back controlling the country. And you have a pre-2001 status quo in which girls can't go to school, and in which the security of the United States from the perspective of could another 9-11 be planned in Afghanistan, that need of ours is in the hands of the Taliban as it was before, uh, before uh, our intervention. Uh, or is there, in your view, the ability to have an agreement, a peace treaty, that actually works to protect American uh, security and that works to give uh, the, the Afghans something other than a return to the kind of rule that they had uh, under the Taliban. We'll go with Noah and then. I mean, in theory, is there a possibility that that kind of agreement could arise? Sure. I kind of don't see how that's possible. The opacity uh, the administration has pursued these negotiations with the Taliban. First of all, there's a, an irony in the fact that they're pursuing them at all, considering that they aggressively attacked the Obama administration for doing just that. Um, I don't foresee any kind of a peace that could arise considering that the Taliban is, the last time I had these talks they were derailed because the Taliban was orchestrating and executing attacks on American service personnel and our assets and our allies in the region while we were, these, uh, these negotiations were ongoing. We had, were conducting them with members of the Taliban regime status quo ante that we essentially had to reconstitute ourselves in order to have a negotiating partner. Um, it's, it's to me an ill-fated enterprise. But the alternative is the Mike Lee, Hort Mike Lee, Bernie Sanders horseshoe to get around to this consensus where the only response from the United States is to withdraw and to execute strikes on targets from 30,000 feet. Who cares what springs up through the rubble? I don't think anybody would be satisfied with that either. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that the, the very fact that the Trump administration uh, is, uh, it, was, was very vocal about how they wanted to negotiate with the Taliban. It, it sort of struck me in the same vein that 
the way that they wanted this North Korean, you know, peninsula depurization. It's just a show. I mean, he wanted to bring them out to Camp David, uh, the Taliban, while U.S. forces were still in action and, and, and people were being killed. And, you know, considering all the, the flack that the, the Obama administration took from them, this is a, really a capitulation. I just think he wants to walk away from it because, again, there's no policy here. There's no doctrine here. This is just something that got into his head. And he just thinks, oh, this will be awesome. Uh, you know, if we can get out of Afghanistan, I can say that we stop U.S. soldiers being killed. Um, the biggest problem in Afghanistan right now isn't the Taliban. It's the Islamic State of Khorasan. It's ISIS's subordinate branch that was there. And let me tell you something. I, I will cop to my own errors. About three years ago, I thought that that group was on the edge of extinction. The Taliban were really fighting them and, and actually tipping us off as to where they were to, to a certain extent. They grow, and they could, in fact, infect the Taliban over time to where you get a new ISIS state. Uh, look, the average person over there just wants to, you know, raise their goats, and uh, which is not a joke. I've uh, been there. They raise their goats. They want their kids to be married. They just want to live their life in an Islamic way that's peaceful to them. Uh, everything else above that is, is you know, 100,000 feet altitude for the average person on the ground in Afghanistan. Uh, but again, I think this administration, the, the Trump administration, is more attuned to just running from Afghanistan for a publicity stunt than anybody else. Bernie Sanders would at least be thoughtful about it. Um, I think there are two truisms that I'll, that I'll talk about. One is that the American public really tires of endless war. It happened in Vietnam and it's happening today. And if you look at all of the Democrat candidates' platforms, they're all talking about some way to get out of the endless wars, a negotiated way to get out of the endless wars. Um, I can't foresee the future if, if there's a Democratic president, but I think it's quite likely, based on the past, that we will walk away, we will leave behind some sort of military training or, you know, overflights or something. But I think there's a high likelihood, and this is the other truism, that ungoverned spaces are problematic for the United States of America. We saw it in Afghanistan before. It, it gave rise to Al-Qaeda and the attack on the United States on 9-11. You look at Somalia now, it's an ungoverned space. Al-Shabaab is there, they're blowing up civilians, um, I don't know how often, it's weekly, I think. Um, Ungoverned spaces are a problem, and I don't know what the answer is, but I do know that the American public consistently grows weary of endless war, and politicians will try to address that. So today is Wednesday. Um, on Monday of this week, uh, finally, uh, the Afghans confirmed the results of the presidential election, confirming Ashraf Ghani as president. Uh, the election occurred September 28th. That's taken them some time. Uh, and now immediately, in the aftermath of that, uh, his runner-up, Abdul Abdullah, has contested the legitimacy of the election. This on the cusp of a peace agreement, as the two sides had apparently uh, under Ambassador Khalilzad, uh, initialed ad ref a final copy of the agreement between the two sides. So we may see actually some Afghanistan back in the headlines, uh, as I said, today is Wednesday. <laughs> By the end of this week or next week, uh, things could unravel pretty quickly there. Um, and, uh, and the Taliban will take full advantage of that. Look, I think the Taliban, their negotiating strategy is a little bit like the Russians. Uh, and I call it, you know, what's mine is mine, what's yours is mine. In other words, as they negotiate, uh, they will take whatever concessions are put on the table, and then with time, once the agreement is sealed, they will violate the terms of it and they will take more. Um, and that is unfortunately what I think will happen with any peace agreement, no matter how artfully it is crafted. Um, and we will see the Taliban return to power at some point uh, in the near future. I, I, I think there's just no way around it. Okay, we spent a lot of time talking about, about Russia. Um, and I want to kind of focus back on that. So uh, this is a country, uh, not going to have a colorful way to describe it, but this is, this is a country that has an economy that's, that's not much larger than the greater New York metropolitan area. 
um, and yet um, it is a world power. So the question is, is, um, is it a world power only because we have let it be a world power? Um, or uh, are the Russians just really good? Is the Putin regime really good at the campaign it has been waging uh, against the West um, that for which there really isn't a good answer? Okay, so um, yes, it's true. Uh, Russia's economy is small. They have a life expectancy that is less than Libya's. They have a corruption index score that is less than Botswana's. Um, but we should not underestimate uh, Russia as a destructive power. Um, and one has to understand that uh, the Putin regime, although the people are suffering, right now economic growth is less than 2%. It was in recession uh, a few years ago. But Putin has accumulated more than $500 billion with a B in hard currency reserves. Uh, this is a regime that can, uh, that can outlast many other states in the world. And furthermore, Putin has developed a national guard, Roskvadia it's called, which has uh, about 350, maybe 400,000 troops. Uh, these, this is the Praetorian Guard of his Kremlin. Um, and so those, you know, it's, uh, there's this perennial habit of trying to predict when uh, things will crack and when there will be a revolution in Russia and a return to democracy of some sort. But, you know, I wouldn't bet on that. And I would bet on Russia's aggressive, destructive power being amplified in various different regions of the world in the years to come. We have already, it is very cheap for Russia to sow chaos and disruption in Western democracies. They've realized all they have to do is, uh, what I call it is funding uncivil societies. So you know, civil society is the bedrock of liberal democracy. What Russia does is they fund uncivil societies. They fund paramilitary training groups in Hungary, neo-Nazi organizations in Sweden, uh, in Slovakia, in the Czech Republic. Often they bring these people to Russia to train them and then they go back. Uh, this is the Russian MO and it is disruptive in another way too. It is, you know, intervening in Syria to prop up Bashar al-Assad, right, as he's up against the ropes to ensure that his regime does not collapse and to ensure that Russia is the chief power broker in the Middle East. Uh, the same thing with General Haftar in Libya right now. They made a very strategic, very low-cost investment in, uh, in Venezuela, uh, propping up uh, Venezuela's oil exports and making a crucial call to Nicolas Maduro right at the right time saying, don't get on that plane to Cuba, we got your back, uh, when he was thinking about it. So this doesn't cost them a lot. People, you know, Barack Obama, I think, very erroneously said, well, Russia has gotten into an Afghanistan like quagmire in Syria. No, they haven't. You know why? Because Vladimir Putin has no intention of reconstructing Syria. They don't think like we do. We're going to go in and nation build. He has no intention of doing that. All he has to do is maintain his bases at Maimim and Tartus, uh, keep his S-400s there and a squadron of fighter jets, and, and he's going to be okay. Uh, you know, and he can continue to have this destructive ability to influence politics around the world for years to come. Uh, and, and we should be prepared for that and not discount that. Um, I agree with all of that. Uh, two things. Two things. Uh, Russia is still the only country in the world that can put a nuclear war head on every semi-major city in the United States tomorrow morning. So right there, you can say their economy is failing, but they still have this nuclear arsenal. The other thing I will say about Russia, and I spent my career and my life as an intelligence officer chasing Russians, Russians have no rules. A KGB colonel told me that. Just always remember the Russians have no rules. And they will be ruthless. Putin is ruthless. He will do anything in his power to survive. And, and don't forget that. Remember Sergei Skripal? Poisoned by the GRU in, in uh, Salisbury. But they didn't care if they left the chemicals around to kill others or infect or, you know, poison others. They have no rules other than survival. Yeah, I agree with everything they both said. <laughs> 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 
probably going to come to a consensus here. Um, and you know, it, it's funny because I started my career as an intelligence operative in the Middle East, right? Um, and when in the last days of the Soviet Union, starting about 1980. And there was one truism there. The, the Russians were everywhere, right? The old KGB, they flood the zone, they were everywhere, every nation state, every place that they could be. What we're looking at, I think, since you have an ex-KGB officer uh, who is now the leader of Russia, who saw that some of the things that the Soviet Union developed could actually work out in his oligarchic society. And that is, you know, from 1917 to 1989, all of Soviet academia was focused on providing information and knowledge to the, the Kremlin regime through the intelligence community. And quite a bit of that was designed for exploitation. They know the fault lines to a great, great detail between every part of American society. Um, in the old days with the Soviet Union, they would just go out and try to buy printing presses in India and hopefully get one article into the news that would make it into the Associated Press or the UPI news stream. Uh, and, you know, they just could not get their disinformation out uh, as fast as the world could determine that it was a lie. But this world has changed. That same man, that same junior KGB lieutenant colonel, I've been to his office in Dresden where he started as a baby spy, as a baby human intelligence officer. The guys in his office would not go out in the field and turn people. Vladimir Putin loved it. And now he's doing it on an international scale, but he's also using everything that was ever learned in the Soviet era about us and has weaponized our own freedom of speech, our own social media communication system. He has isolated Russia from that. They, they've taken V-Contact, their own system, and have separated it from Facebook and Twitter and all the other organizations. He's gotten, he's gotten Russia today, which is essentially a cable news version of Pravda, to be considered a respectable news organization around the world because it does report the news. But like all good disinformation weapon systems, it does it in such a selective way that the truth is actually a lie or is shaping your worldview to agree with their worldview, which is why they've got Donald Trump in such a nice basket, because he exists in a bubble of information which was put there when he was trying to get Trump Tower in Moscow. Could have said it started when he went to the Soviet Union in 1987, but I'm not going to say their long ball game is that long. Vladimir Putin right now is has used Russia, which is a poor nation with atomic bombs and essentially a giant gas station, but they have leveraged the vacuum of disinformation, our ability to not respond as a democracy to freedom of speech that they're executing, that crafts these false cult-like bubbles around our own citizens. So, at the expense of a few KGB officers getting indicted, or sorry, FSB officers getting indicted by, in, in the, by the Mueller uh, investigation, he has changed 40% of this nation's opinion because he worked with other people who think that they all see along the same line in meta narratives that were as simple as Donald Trump good, Russia good, Hillary Clinton emails him, and amplified that to the point where right now we are in our own information civil war. And who knows whether that's going to go to a shooting war. I don't think so, but there are a lot of people out there right now who have some strong opinions about that. So that's where we stand. I too agree with all my colleagues. <laughs> um, so the last three consecutive presidents campaigned for office on the premise that their predecessor was needlessly hostile towards Russia, and that Russia was acting out as a result of this hostility. Um, this is a very chauvinistic point of view. Um, Moscow understands its position. GDP is a really terrible way to understand an adversary. Some of our largest threats have really bad GDPs. So Great Britain was an American state, it'd be around Alabama. But it has the capacity to project sustained power. Moscow has the capacity and will to project sustained power. And it has done so. It has carved up Georgia, essentially uh, 
integrated uh, Kazakhstan South Ossetia into the Russian Federation. It has invaded and annexed territory in Europe for the first time since 1945. The last person to do that, by the way, was Stalin. Um, and it has invaded and intervened in the conflict in Syria. And it tends to be there for quite some time. And it's testing its parameters because this is a country that understands its, its window for action is closing. And it is aggressively seeking to pursue and maintain its interests while it has this window of opportunity. And that is a recipe for miscalculation, which you can transgress against the Atlantic Alliance in a way that Russia doesn't anticipate, doesn't want to, but necessitates a response on our part that could be military in nature. And that's what we like to avoid. Everybody wants to avoid it. But worse can, also, can start sometimes by accident. And that's what a dangerous miscalculation on Russia's part would achieve. China, when we talk about China as being a much longer term threat, that's what we mean. This is a much less risk prone regime than Moscow, and that's why it's such a great threat. Okay, we're uh, going to turn to questions from all of you. Andy. So, one word, I think. Use with a lot of what you're saying is, is disruption. And when a country can disrupt because they, they have no rules, the only rule they have is whatever the goal is, how are they going to get there? And if a candidate or people running for office do the same thing, so in other words, whatever the goal is, the road doesn't matter how you get there. How is that stopped? How is because of the internet being able to cross the world immediately, how if a candidate flies? makes things up and people want to believe that, how does a other candidate play by the rules? How do you do that? How do like say that you're saying you go we're not going to go to war, physical war with another candidate. How do we how do we survive a system where it's just built on destruction, which is built on whatever I say to get what I want? Who wants to tackle that? I want to tackle that. <laughs> Education. Education is the answer, and if I can put in a plug for my uh, employer, FBRI, we're developing a critical thinking uh, curriculum for, for high schools that we're putting into the Philadelphia public high schools that take historiography, historical evidence, and case studies. And the first one we've developed is on the rise of Nazi Germany in the 1930s, and we're presenting historical evidence People who said, A, it was good, trains run on time, full economy, we're heading for it. On the other side, information about you know, the bad things they were doing. And asking students to think critically and develop mechanisms to judge what they're hearing and ask questions. What's that person's bias? Is this incomplete information? Education, in my opinion, is the antidote. Really quick. One of the things that I found when I was, was studying Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State, uh, they are technically, the Al-Qaeda being the original model, they are technically the fifth time a major cult has crop, cropped up in Islam. And the other four times, Islam dealt very harshly with them. Uh, but, and how they did it was confrontation. Uh, the Saudis, to a certain extent, understood this, that you could only confront someone who has a belief in a corrupt system, you know, corrupt interpretation, only so much. And then you have to re-educate them, recraft their belief system. And we used to refer to this in, in our operations as the weapon of doubt. You have to actually confront them, argue with them, and get them to where they have to question their own belief system. It's very hard. And technically, it's cult deprogramming. Um, you know, the funny thing is, there's a, there's a, there's a book out by a, a guy uh, who, was a, who was a great cult expert called the, Trump, the Cult of Trump, where people just will not believe anything you say because you said it and it was against Donald Trump. Even if it was his own words, they don't believe it. And it goes to when he said, only believe what I tell you to believe. So until you can actually, you know, in my, my, the way I do it is, I directly confront people. You have to let them not be allowed to be comfortable in a lie. Um, I was invited last year to, to Auschwitz. Uh, and the situation in global disinformation has gotten so bad that they had a conference called Never Again. Really? 
And the very fact that Auschwitz is having a conference where they are questioning whether the commitment to never mass murdering people on a genocidal scale is viable in the current information environment that we're in is crazy. And of course, one of the first things you gotta do is you have to confront people. They'll say, well, uh, you're an idiot, that's not true. But even though for that instance, that's satisfying, that's not gonna necessarily change their mindset. You have to be able to, to, to introduce doubt as to the veracity of what they say. And that is very hard in the current environment, information environment we live in. Sure. Yes, I have a question. Sure. One of the things is I have when I listen to the news, and one of the things that you were speaking of is how we have to accept the news for a good example. We speak a lot about what happened to things that in Europe, but we don't talk about things that have happened in America. One of the things that I look at the news, we don't talk about, as you say. Right now, we know how Donald Trump it is. Everything on the news should be negative towards what Donald Trump is saying. Not to be able to compare him what Joe Biden did and not talk about what his daughter has done and what his son has done. If you don't do that, then you've given the people the information that they want on one side, not on both sides. That's the reason why that I think the news is so important. Because when you do this, we have to be able to look at both sides and make a decision. And we're not doing that. If you look at the news that we do now, everything from us for Biden, everything is right there. Nothing, as you talk about tonight, think about Donald Trump's son, about his daughter, and about the things that he has done to America. And I think that the news have to begin to do this order from us and, and the community to begin to understand this. Uh, can I touch on that real quick? Sure. Here's part of the problem because the, the beauty of, of, of my position uh, within the media is I am not a journalist. Okay. I'm, I, you know, I'm an intelligence professional who happens to be commentating. Which means that I've actually had people confront me about this where they say, well, you have to maintain balance, you have to maintain objectivity. No, that's for people who went to journalism school. That balance, objectivity, and the parameters of everything they learned in journalism school is being weaponized against the media. Donald Trump himself said, um, I want to say he said it to Andrea Mitchell, where he said, the reason I attack you is to delegitimize you. It's so that people won't believe you when you Technically, when you find out something true. That's what totalitarian nations do. That's what dictators do. Uh, and unfortunately, it's the environment we live in. And again, education is a key component of that as well. And I think the news media sort of fails us. I mean, we're, we're living in an environment where just a few months ago, the museum, the museum of news, had to be sold off to a university because no one was interested in visiting and learning about the news. I mean, that's just where we are now. You are just as good at educating individually uh, people in your information sphere about what is what kind of game is being played. Sure. Yeah, briefly on, on that point, um, I didn't go to day school either. Uh, but I do maintain a commitment to not just objectivity, but fairness, out of a sense of an objective that I seek to achieve, which is to maintain some sort of a channel by which I can effectively communicate with somebody who doesn't agree with me and maybe change their mind. Performative objectivity is worthless. You're maybe hearing a lot about Joe Biden right now because we're in the middle of the primaries. But Donald Trump does don kind of dominate the news. It's kind of hard not to acknowledge the fact that the media is very much focused on the president, and the president demands that focus. He sucks up a lot of attention and energy. And if you were to take the bad and project the bad, and only the bad, you're not going to get to the 42% who already distrust the press, who already aren't listening to you. And if you have any hope of, of appealing to that sector of American society, which is not a small sector of American society, and just happened to win the last election, and they win this election, then you have to adapt a at least an outlook that entertains the prospect that
that you might be wrong. I just say one really quick addition to this. Uh, so I think a lot of issues have already been identified, but you know, part of the problem is this media habit of presenting two sides, sort of the CNN MO. You have you know someone talking about civil rights on the one hand, and then David Duke on the other hand, because it gets good ratings. Well, you can't have truth and a lie and compare it. That that does not work. And unfortunately, you know. For example, take the, the Biden story, which was you know in the news for months and months. Uh, initially, there were a lot of very lazy journalists out there who said, well, you know, it is alleged that Biden had this corrupt prosecutor fired because he was investigating this company. Um, why did they, but you know, other people say that that wasn't true or they're, you know, they didn't send their journalists to Kiev to do the tough work of asking the anti-corruption community in Ukraine, what is the actual ground truth here? Where everyone will tell you that the prosecutor was corrupt, that the EU, that the IMF, that the whole US government were calling for him to remove, be removed. It takes some legwork to do that. The easy sort of journalistic fallback is to say, well, they claim this, but they claim this. You figure it out, reader. Okay, we're going to do two more, one over here, one over here, so. Yeah. Um, it, it seems back on like the domestic trends and threat issue that populism is on the rise, on the right, maybe even on the left, certainly the far left. I'm wondering if you see that as something that we're dealing with internally that's coming up that foreign policy people are going to have to deal with going forward, or is that a factor of disruption of external factors of Trump coming down? If it is, if populism is where we're going, how do we deal with that in the foreign policy community, which at least traditionally in the, in the grand scheme of things is very against them? Well, I, I can take a first crack at that. I, I think a liberal, this gets back to my introductory remarks, I think sort of illiberal populism is one of the greatest threats that we face and it can uh, transform democracies into authoritarian states as we're seeing in Hungary, as we're seeing potentially in this country, uh, as has been alluded to. Why is this happening? A number of factors, I think, one crucial uh, over time sociologists have shown we're participating less in civil society networks and we're doing more on social media networks and so instead of sort of having that interaction with a diverse cross-section of people uh, with whom we may have some views in alignment but where we may disagree on other views we're isolating ourselves into these bubbles uh, with like-minded peers and those who share our same identities uh, and that's not good that's sort of forcing us into this polarized environment. The second issue is actually polarization. It is the fact that whereas, you know, 40, you know, 35, 40 years ago, there were elements of the Democratic Party and elements of the Republican Party, which were more or less the same. In fact, your more conservative Democrats uh, on foreign policy may have been to the right of the more liberal Republicans. But now the parties have separated completely. And you see this not just in the US, this is what's happened in Brazil. It's happened in Argentina, in Turkey, in Poland, and so many other societies. And this polarization results in the demonization of the other side, right? They are evil, therefore, whatever they say, I am not gonna believe them. And it plays into illiberal demagogy. Um, and the last thing is, there is a tendency within uh, a lot of industrialized middle-class democracies uh, to experience um, deaths of despair, what's been called as deaths uh, of despair. Uh, alcoholism, addiction, um, uh, other types of suicide, afflictions that result from sort of lack of social economic security, a sense that you're falling out of your station in life and may not make it, in fact. And it afflicts countries that have really good macroeconomic indicators like the US and ones that have bad ones like Greece during the debt crisis. But what it does uniformly is it fuels the sort of the polarization and the demagogy that lead to uh, illiberal populism. I just dovetail on that point because I write about this pretty frequently. Populist movements have a habit of adopting apocalypticism mm -hmm. uh, and projecting a, a sort of what, I, what is really out of proportion assessment of what relative threats actually are. Um, and that can have a really deleterious effect on you psychologically. Um, you might just simply tune out, or you might radicalize as a result of that sort of um, agitation. The, you know, from automation to climate change, most recently what, co what comes to mind is the assassination of the strike on Qasem Soleimani, which was met by populist agitators on the right and the left, 
as the, the inauguration of the Third World War. Um, obviously, that has not come to pass, uh, thankfully. Um, but if you were to talk to an expert in the region, or a military expert, or anybody who doesn't have any attachment to these populist philosophies and isn't just a rabble rabble, they would have told you that that's nonsense. Maybe they would love, maybe they like the strike, maybe they didn't like the strike, but they didn't think that was an appropriate way to approach the dialogue. Um, you're gonna, you see a lot of that in populist movements and combating apocalypticism on just about every front, because it's almost always wrong, um, is, is really valuable. Things are actually quite good. When it comes to America's Forever Wars, for example, the American footprint abroad has been, has been this small in 60 years. You don't hear about that, because good news doesn't really sell. But there's a lot of it out there. Please, last question. China. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll say a few brief words. So uh, I, I contend that China is in this camp of illiberal authoritarian governments that want to attack the West. And we shouldn't be fooled by uh, Xi Jinping's relative good behavior, at least manners, when, it, when compared to Putin. Because I think he wants to undermine the West as much as Putin, if not more, uh, and maybe has a longer time horizon, in fact, than Putin does. Uh, but China is, of course, very different for a number of structural reasons. You know, they depend on export-led uh, globalization to fuel their economy, so they're not uh, a petrostate like Russia is, which in fact benefits from, say, uh, oil shocks. Um, uh, China wants to have some semblance of global order because it benefits from it, but it also wants to usurp it and twist it to its uh, to its own ends. Uh, but uh, I think China is the long-term threat that we face. Uh, Russia is certainly likely to be a threat in the near term, maybe a long term as well. But uh, the, the irony is that, you know, I think Trump's instincts in finally challenging China on market access, on intellectual property rights, on their unfair trade practices, currency manipulation, all of that is right. I think that the problem is that the way he's gone about confronting them is unilaterally. Once again, it's this lack of um, respect for collective action. If we went at this with our allies, we might have some chance of success. When we go at it alone, not so much. Um, most of the region involved in the TPP would much rather have the United States as the principal member, not China. Although most of the countries in, in the TPP, China is their major trading partner not the United States, but for a lot of reasons they'd rather have us be the principal country in TFP. Another thing on China, I think worth mentioning, and I agree with everything you said, um, China has really not played the constructive role it might have. We haven't talked about Korea tonight, but not much anyway. But China is, I think, would be an ideal partner to restrain or bring Korea to the negotiating table, but they haven't done so. Quick, quick little comment. A um, couple of years ago, I was invited to a, a counter extremism conference that was being held in Belgium uh, at the behest of the King of Belgium. It was interesting, we did a tabletop exercise, and at this exercise, we were supposed to come up with three fundamental human rights, right? What were three things that every person in the room could agree to? And at my table, was a representative of the Chinese government. And the one thing she flat out, flipped down, refused to endorse was liberty. I mean, I, I said, look, you are a great representative of your government. Um, the Chinese are sort of like, I, I feel that the Chinese are sort of like the United States was in the 1950s. We are expanding into markets. We are trying to gain new places and allies. China right now is buying Africa, quietly, right? They are feeding themselves, turning places that you would never have thought would have been, you know, viable markets. They are turning them into, you know, in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, where, where I recently was in Ghana, they don't want those shirts that we donate anymore. They can get them cheaper and new from China with a level of dignity and respect. And the Chinese make their headway into markets we've abandoned for decades. I mean, we have a president of the United States that refers to them in you know, derogatory terms. China's game is long ball. 
They love what they're doing, and, and to be quite blunt about it, they are eating our lunch economically everywhere that we don't have our attention turned to. And so China is quiet, or seemingly quiet, and allowing themselves to take Donald Trump's little jabs and comments because they are just going to take our markets when we are fighting amongst each other. As our foreign <laughs> policy changes, they will just quietly move their way through the islands of the Southeast uh, you know, Asia, and they will meet their own hegemonistic goals at, on their timetable. You got the last Real word. Real thank you. Thank you. This is gonna sound very ideological because it is. Um, Within the conservative movement, there is a, uh, a lot of panic over the intensity of the nationalist project in China and the extent to which they're exerting their influence on American institutions from the NBA to Disney to demonstrate deference to the Chinese narrative, whatever it happens to be. During the Hong Kong demonstrations, there's a big uproar within the NBA because some of its members said some positive things about that, and then its other members were compelled to, to tamp that down. China's nine dash line is evident in Disney films. These sort of things really drag you nuts if you're a conservative. But that does suggest to me a little bit of fragility and paranoia on the part of the Chinese. This is a market that they cannot compete in, really, the marketplace of ideas, which is why they're so content on distorting the marketplace. Wall Street Journal is no longer in China today because one of its columnists, an intellectual on in the opinion page, wrote something they didn't like. That's not the act of a nation that is particularly invested in its own strength of purpose. That's a really paranoid response. Um, and as the Chinese economy begins to cool, we might begin to see a little bit more of that. And it's not a fear of us that's animating that. It's a fear of their own people. Okay, I want to thank our guests. I want to thank all of you.